Um, welcome. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for holding on for the slightly delayed start. Uh, we had our termly address as staff by um, our Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of College, hence why the slightly late kickoff. Um, we're going to go straight into things. Um, I decided, as part of my very brief introduction to, um, to Nick Bell, this evening's speaker, that, that it would be it would be rude almost to mention some of the things that I've heard and read about Nick. It would be really inappropriate to mention that Nick's a huge Norwich football team supporter because Norwich are on the verge of um, relegation. That, there you have been. It's already happened. It's already happened. So, so let's move straight on from that and we'll, we'll not mention... Um, Nick's choice of uh, football team. What I can tell you about Nick is that um, I was going to say he once sat here, but I don't think this building was Didn't even exist. here back in the heady days of the late 80s when Nick uh, was a student here at what was then LCP. So he graduated in 87, um, set up Nick Bell Design in 88, and then went off to work elsewhere before restarting Nick Bell Design, we think in 2004, so yeah. about 10 years ago. Um, Nick, uh, th there's a beautiful synergy here because a fortnight after our last speaker, John uh, of iMagazine, um, Nick is in, and Nick was creative director at iMagazine between 97 and 2005. Okay, so it was a fortuitous link. Um, Nick is a member of AGI. He's recently joined the university as uh, chair of communication design. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about Nick's company. He's going to talk to you about designing for experience. He's going to talk to you about the work that he's been involved in um, across uh, the museum sector. Um, I'm going to remind us of the format. Anyone not been to one of these before? Okay, so if you're new to this, the way this works is that this microphone, after Nick's 20 minutes of presenting, is thrust, thrust, thrust in your hands, <coughs> um, and you get to uh, control the next 20 minutes. Okay, so it's good to see notebooks are ready, pens ready, because it's over to you guys. So 20 minutes of Nick. Uh, we've asked for uh, Ben on the stopwatch. Nick's asked for a five-minute warning five minutes before the end, and you'll get a hand like that. And uh, without further ado, um, I give you Nick Bell of Nick Bell Design. So this is me, and I have, I guess, four roles as director of Nick Bell Design and UAL Chair of Communication Design, not Visual Communication, that's Scott King. Uh, I'm visiting critique of the Royal College of Art, but that doesn't really mean much because I just go to the shows and the working project progress shows. <laughs> that's about it, really. Um, although I am showing some student work from there in this talk. And then I get away with being special consultant to I, but I can talk about that because I've just written an article about a museums conference that... Uh, is uh, on the iBlog at the moment. So I see myself, I'm an editorial designer coming from very much the print domain. And as Lauren said, I spent um, getting on for eight years at iMagazine where I, I learned how to do that. I, don't, I hadn't really properly designed a magazine before I did that. And working with John uh, made that much easier as well as working with Nick Deschamps, who did all the repro graphics for it, also another person who was a really important collaborator. I also applied those skills, designing books for Martin Parr, for Fiden, the second edition has just came out, Martin Parr was introducing it last week, um, working with Rick Poyner, another collaborator on Communicate, one of the few exhibitions solely about graphic design that's ever happened in Britain and also uh, a series of artist monographs for Tate Publishing, which other designers are still using the format template for, producing new books 15 years on from when they were originally designed. But now I'm, I'm applying th this sort of editorial way of looking and, and, and structuring and organizing content in, in the spatial setting of, of museums. Um, and this example is the BNFL Visitor Center that I worked on with Cass and Mann and the Science Museum. It was curated by the Science Museum back in 2002. Had a life of about two or so years. Um, 
also with Cass and Mann, the Churchill Museum, which is uh, a museum that's incredibly dense with content. This is the lifeline. 26 people can use it at once, and most people spend an inordinate amount of time, much more time at it than you would normally expect for that sort of thing. Um, it, it was designed just before touch screens. It's, people tend to touch the projected surface, but it uses a strip on its edge. And the other place at the Science Museum, the Atmosphere Gallery, which is still open, you can go and see it, um, that, was, that opened in 2010. And then opening in July, the First World War Galleries at the Imperial War Museum, when the Imperial War Museum reopens with all the building work that Fosters have been doing. This is a new gallery in, the, in there. But I want to concentrate on um, my sort of viewpoints and hopes for the future for experience, designed for experience in museums, what works, what doesn't. Um, and there's sort of three aspects of it. There's permission, you know, that the space that you're in has to kind of signal some kind of permission that you're able to get involved in something, able to be active. Then there's the participation itself, that there's things in that space that hold your attention. And then you might be wondering, why am I doing these things? Well, you might want to do them for a reason. So active participation might be called speculation. So just to, to get going, I'm going to read this out, because they're very specific points, and it's one way of ensuring I get this in in 20 minutes. But let's see how we go. So, don't worship gamification. The gamification of interactives to draw out more complicated messages is not working. Visitors love highly immersive experiences such as this, the Atmosphere Gallery at the Science Museum. But messages and information museums want to get across are not getting through. In fact, this is something that Tim Malloy told me um, at you know, this is why these spaces are good networking spaces. He told me this at the uh, Senep 2020. Uh, he says that interactives employing game-like strategies re are requiring far more time than visitors are preparing to give, which on average is about 30 seconds. So, ban surprises then. So if you... If you do have a mine of information to deliver that you want to do so interactively and intuitively, why not use the most established and familiar interface tropes of devices everyone is already using? Swiping and scrolling on touch screens. Take up will be high, the experience will be fast and therefore will afford deeper drilling by those so inclined. So this is a simple and straightforward way to engage with information that will complement the more poetic, dramatic and entertaining approach coming up next. Make art work. Identify the big ideas, the important top level inf messages that are the building blocks of understanding and make great, big, simple, beautiful, interactive artworks of them. Now, there is a ton of ingenious, highly original interactive works out there, all screaming for a purpose, and advertising is busy wasting them on opportunistic marketing stunts, gossamer thin. But museums are the spiritual home for this stuff. And this is David Hedberg, he's an information experience design MA student at the RCA. You have to, to get this television to work, to tune it, you have to sit in front of it and smile. It's the rictus smile of consumer culture, you could call it. It's, it's the medium that dictates how it is consumed, with the viewer as the aerial using face recognition software, I presume. So half the air in a given space, Martin Creed's balloon room. My question, is this a physics lesson? Because if it is, I couldn't get my daughter out of it. It works. Now, staying with air, Francesco Tacchini's Ulinka Ebhart's and Will Yate Johnson's sinister, eavesdropping, hovering black ball that records what it hears and plays it back just afterwards. 
and it's what that woman just heard. Again by MA students from Information Experience Design at the RCA. It's brilliant. Don't worship consistency. So if words are important, make sure each chunk of the narrative is a snag to get caught on. No one wants to read museum text set efficiently into paragraph after sober paragraph of serried columns. Actually, museums don't really like this, but from my experience, interpretation text material is most accessible and most engaging as a ragged conglomeration of short chunks, and we've tested this. Lines breaking where natural pauses are in speech, indents according to sentence structure. This is not text, this is not text, this is text set not for reading, but for scanning, for speech, in fact. Each chunk distinguishable as a detachable bite of the narrative. And if you want as much text as this on a single carrier, and some museums do, this is how it needs to look. Not pretty. Well, to most typographers it's not pretty. But effective in this kind of environment of museums. It catches the eye. And of course, printed editorial design for time-poor readers has known this for a long time. Daily newspapers are a great example of the chunky approach, but even more so are their websites, snagging the reader's hurried eye as it darts about the screen. Make it contestable. Signal the capacity for museum interpretation to be contestable by, by visitors by designing display components that visitors can see can be amended, updated or replaced. And by making it clear that if visitors take issue with interpretation, the ensuing debate that is encouraged can lead to the display being altered to take account of their view. Such an alteration does not have to actually take place. Making sure the capacity for revision is clearly evident is most important. It's the promise of it. So this reinforces the view that interpretation is often subjective. That even if objective, evidence can be incomplete and may be needed and may needed to be contested by visitors, preferably. And this is Merthyr, it's a project we did for Merthyr Tydfil Old Town Hall, a, a town hall turned into an art centre by the local um, um, housing association there, taken out of the hands of the local council that couldn't be trusted. So these, uh, this is a system made of steel, cold rolled steel, that, um, where the panels, you can remove the end panels and then the, the information panels can be slid off and then rearranged in the order that, that a visitor wants or a curator wants. Um, and they're covered with, uh, the graphics is printed onto adhesive vinyl, so that can easily be, each panel can easily be reskinned, and the client has a template um, to replace the content if they want. Don't be dumb. By foregrounding the institution, branding excludes other voices. Obsessed with authority and ownership, branded environments are monocultures that resist the participation of visitors. Invitations to participate are inauthentic, insincere, when voiced exclusively by the distorting rhetoric of corporate values. Prizing consistency and coherence so highly affords no space for contestability, where visitor participation might happen. An exhibition is an editorial design that should be free of such a straitjacket that prevents it from articulating as specifically as it needs to on a subject. And at its participatory best, an exhibition empowers people to question what they see 
and ultimately is a design with the facility to be altered by them. Branded spaces are dumb to this possibility. This is what we, this is a, a project we worked on. It's on at the moment. It's a temporary exhibition at the Natural History Museum about the history of uh, the human species in three different types of species for a million years in the British Isles. And we were told we had to follow the, follow the brand guidelines of the, uh, of the institution, which was like, I guess it was like having your arms tied around your back. So, um, design something else. I oh, know I've hopped. Don't design an exhibition. Design often reinforces traditional modes of museum behaviour. Before museum visitors will engage in speculation, the setting of the museum needs to actively encourage it. It needs to help people unlearn the way they think they are supposed to behave in a museum. The spectacle, by its own nature, makes the visitor a spectator. It's obvious. Designers and curators need to learn the participative techniques that might get people acting less passively, less in awe of what the designer or curator is trying to do, and thinking more about what they want to do. And this is an image of the, um, it's the European Parliament Visitors Centre in Brussels. It's the, it's the very spectacular map room that opened in uh, 2011. So design something else. Other models need to be imported if we are to get visitors behaving less inhibitedly as protagonists or speculators. Design a place of action, not exhibition. Design a space for ongoing visitor production. Design a workshop, a playground, a dance floor, or in this case, a debating chamber another of the spaces at the Parliamentarium in Brussels. So it's designed by Stuttgart-based Atelier Bruckner, uh, and visitors get a chance to um, fight a particular political corner, like an MEP, like a member of European Parliament. But strangely, they're not giving any choice as to which political corner they might fight. So it seems completely, a complete missed opportunity and quite cynical to me, but then but then it is Brussels. Don't make objects the object. Muse museums find the dematerialised nature of speculative, des speculative design difficult to square with what museums are. Museums are about the display of desirable objects. They commodify desire and do so not so differently from shopping malls. And I'm not against this, but we, we urgently need museums to fulfil other functions too. Modern government is totally dysfunctional. America is a bought political system and it is not that different in Europe. So what do we do? Well, one of the things we can do, I think we need more public spaces in which the focus is less on the object less on celebrated individuals and more on issues and devoted specifically to the social connections between people seen in these Martin Parr photographs of uh, his black country stories. So make debate the object. The museum's consultant Elaine Human gurian speaking at Central St Martin's just last month said Quote, museums present evidence. Notice I do not say objects, unquote. And this is what the Science Museum attempted to do with us on the design of the atmosphere gallery I showed you earlier in 2010. It wanted a different contract between museum and visitor in a gallery without objects where visitors could commit to concrete actions over climate change that would reduce their carbon footprint. This is an image from our original tender document that won us the project. The Science Museum did present undeniable scientific evidence that climate change is caused by humans, but sadly, due to unforeseeable external events, 
banishing objects and getting visitors to comment to commit to action wasn't possible. Don't rush to explain. Even though the museum world is full of objects, it is dominated by text. Museums like to surround objects with information packages, as museums researchers call it, and these can deny the visitor a moment's communion with the object, the space to think for themselves. This is our work for the Greek gallery up in the Great North Museum in Newcastle. So let people feel it. As exhibition designer Casson Mann said recently, we don't want to know what the objects are, we just want to feel it. Experiments at the Medical Museum by a PhD student in Copenhagen are about a shift from text to object, but also about bringing all the senses into play. The approach is called, get your pens ready, unconscious haptic experience mediated by vision. It's a reference from a Finnish architect called Palasma. How you can get to know an object's haptic qualities, what it feels like, even though it is displayed inside a secure glass case where you can't touch it, like most objects in museums. Don't be clever, as it might be mistaken for stupidity. Has everyone seen Alain de Botton's comments in the Rijksmuseum that have just been hung, his, his art as therapy, as if museums need more text? But the good thing about post-it notes, even oversized ones, is that they're easily disposed of. They're just tacked to the wall very informally. It's the only good thing about them, really. Instead, it's better to be stupid, as it might be mistaken for genius. I can't give a talk about exhibition design without mentioning my experiences at the Martin Creed exhibition at the Hayward, which I just thought was absolutely amazing. So the idea with that, with that experience and with that exhibition, the idea of the visitor as producer, as speculator, has never, it's not really quite appeared so attainable. This is work number 916. And last of all, to finish off, don't finish it. The notion that the visitor has content is one of the great changes, another Elaine Human gurian quote. So if your exhibition is complete and the curators and designers have thought of everything, ask yourself, where does the visitor with content fit in? This museum in Sweden opens exhibitions unfinished. And that's the end. So I didn't quite finish, which is just exactly, I had three more lines which I can ask in answering questions, sure, if there's anything missing. So, thank you. What were the last three lines that we didn't get, Nick? So in, yeah, let's go back to the image. So this is a, it's a museum in Sweden called the uh, Mölndals City Museum near Gothenburg. And it... Uh, it opens exhibitions unfinished, and it assembles its collections, uh, like this one, about the 1980s, as you can see. Well, some of us might recognise that. Uh, from, they assemble the collections from the local community, so they put a call out to, and, and let everybody know this is what they were planning to do, and then gradually, over a period of time, they collected the exhibition. So essentially, it did kind of start unfinished, and this is kind of the way they like to work. So it's very much a museum that's entirely predicated on um, the memory of the local community. Uh, just a um, bold open question, given the amount of exhibition design stuff you do now. Um, do we have too many museums? Is, are there too many exhibitions? Is that one of the problems that we're having with defining them now? Well, I think we have too many museums doing exactly the same thing. We have too many museums writing exactly the same briefs. We have too many museums using design in the same way. Too many museums using curatorship in the same way. Um, and too many museums about objects. And not enough exhibitions or spaces. You don't, they don't need to be museums, they just need to be public spaces. And of course, you know, there's a big debate about public space and how that's sort of being reduced. Um, we need public spaces in which 
They're just spaces there for us to kind of act in. You obviously need to give visitors something to work with, some meat to chew, and a kind of structure that, is, that, that, that has space in them to sort of place what they're brought to it. It doesn't mean that it's kind of unfinished in the kind of slightly punk way, in the sort of mesh. It's not about being polished. You can still produce an exhibition that's, that's unfinished, but is still polished. It's, it's about the structure. So we need, we need more museums, more multi-use spaces, as Jane Jacobs talks about them. She thinks, and Elaine Hermengurian talked about this at the Chaos Conference as well, that the world's a safer place if we have m more places where strangers can meet in public spaces and see each other. They don't have to talk, they just need to be in that sort of visual relationship, responding and engaging with the same things. This is the thing that museums are really good at. I think it also kind of leads me to sort of two parts of the question, because it's not so much right, if we need the museums, and I think you've answered that really uh, neatly, but is it about the collections and the things we show or the people that we get in to see? And does that need to be readdressed? Or is it the actual collection and the exhibition that needs to be readdressed? Or the way that we access it for people? Because it seems to me one of the real problems is regardless of whatever they do with museums, the target audience very rarely changes in, yeah, it, in terms very, of that's true. demographics, in terms there's of class, etc. I mean, as a graphic designer, and all other graphic designers would, would know this, there's a lot of talk about um, accessibility, but it usually means a sans serif typeface uh, of a certain kind. They never talk about intellectual accessibility, but a lot of museums talk about layering. So layering is not like visual layering like we had from the 90s. It's a kind of the idea that there are different sort of levels, different places, um, in, the, in the space where content can be, can address um, different sort of demographics, um, different sort of levels of intelligence, and, 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 and done in a kind of really integrated way. It's more about, you know, how far do you want to drill, actually. But uh, the thing, I think what's not really understood is this, which showing that, 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 that research work by that PhD student in Copenhagen just about the haptic qualities of objects, just about, I mean, that's, that's hardcore design. Um, and, and this is not what is, it's not, just not very well understood how that kind of, that's design research. And it's debatable whether the UAL even understand what design research is. I think they understand what research is in the kind of art field, but definitely, it doesn't seem to me they do in the design field. And it's work like that that's, where you can actually see how it might deliver something. The fact that you can't touch a lot of objects in a museum because they're too precious. Um, but, you know, how can we get a sense of what they feel like visually? It's, I think her work was fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the process. What's the sort of cutoff point <coughs> between something that's too gimmicky, do you sort of test it out on a small audience before launching it, or do you have...? Well, that's a good thing about exhibition design. Most projects last at least eight months. Some projects go on for two years. So there's always a stage where you're, um, you're kind of testing out a production process with a contractor. So that contractor's trying to prove that they can do what you're asking of them. And that's often the moment in the process, which is in the sort of detail design sort of periods, you've got, you know, con you've got concept, development of concept, and then what they call detail, it's kind of architectural term. It's, it's coming, you know, we, we work to the Reba state work stages and one of them's called detail, but um, it's about where you start detailing the design. And it's usually at that point, hopefully not before you have completely finalized it, where things can still change, the detail can change. And hopefully you know what you're doing, so nothing huge is going to go wrong. Often, you know, you have to completely rethink something. That's not uncommon at all. Um, but there's, that's the great thing about, about exhibition design is the testing. That is not just testing design processes and, and, uh, and the particular approaches that are technical, but also um, curatorial approaches in terms of, will the audience understand this? Do they actually know what's going on here? So there was, 
they asked for, for atmosphere, they asked the audience, did they, you know, about climate change. And it seemed that people didn't really understand, or they were using the phrase, and I think this still happens, global warming interchangeably with climate change. So, that, it, it, so the, the, the curators understood that where the limitations were and what they had to sort of make clear in the exhibition from those slight confusions. Um, this is an area like I'm quite interested in. As a graduate, I was kind of wondering, um, from my experience or my knowledge of museums, which is obviously fairly limited, um, the structure of museums isn't. Are they kind of are they aware of what you're saying about how these changes that need to happen? Um, kind of are they open to people approaching them with new ideas, or is there a change of structure that needs to happen? I'm just quite interested in whether they kind of. Um, are open to new ideas and new ways of doing things or not? From I, think your experience. I think the people, as individuals, are all open to new ideas. It's just that they're kind of arranged in a very rigid structure. That even if they wanted to, it makes perhaps that makes it difficult for them. I well, I've followed. A, often these things get said at conferences, and then people forget about them. So that's why it's important to kind of write down what happened at a conference so everybody remembers it. But there was a conference about a month ago or two months ago now. Um, about um, museums 30 years into the future. And I just followed, I didn't go to it, I followed the Twitter stream for it, and it was like being there. You get all the highlights. And actually, it was very clear that they're all really into this idea of uh, visitors having all the content and then creating structures where you can kind of encourage them to use that. As, uh, in, in, so, to, to, so it essentially... They're really excited. All these people are really excited by the idea of museums being places where it's, it, it, it's just not a passive experience. It's a really active, speculating experience. It's a really so exciting how, thing. How would, do you think the structures inside museums can be changed? You, maybe it's just going to take someone doing something. Yeah. It's like climate change. Nothing's going to happen until there's a complete and terrible disaster before people do anything. With museums, hopefully it's something will be such a fantastic success that it might, often these things, things move on in sudden leaps yeah. in, in these kind of things. It might take someone just getting away with something in the mainstream. Mondal's museum is sort of a little bit in the, on the fringes, really, just for a local community. Yeah. So in some people's minds, maybe it just doesn't count. It's too easy. I thought it'd be useful, uh, as someone who's also done a lot of work in the cultural world, more in communication design, given the long process and that inquiry, I just thought, and given we've talked a bit about how we're all as designers needing to collaborate more, could you say, I just thought, could you share a bit more about the kind of collaboration in yeah. that process and also bring in, I think, how the collaborative process of being an editorial designer helped? Yes, yes. I think that's a really good, really good point. Good. Um, thanks for that, Deborah. It gives me an opportunity. I mean, there are co of course, there, everybody's talking about collaboration. <laughs> Everyone's banging on about collaboration. But it really, really is really important. You can't understand and state how important collaboration is. I mean, I was listening to Richard Sennett, a sociologist who's sort of look, looking at cities. He wrote a book called Together, which is all about cooperation, how we've lost those skills to work with other people who we don't understand very well. They might be culturally different, but we've lost that ability a little bit. Um, he talked about the, one of the... He, it's his opinion that up, in, up, in the, up until the Second World War, in, say, a city like London, we were very good at um, kind of public architecture and, play, and, and kind of uh, the design of housing. And he sees that that sort of completely fell apart uh, with the Second World War. And, and, and obviously, a lot had to be done very, very quickly, and it had to be uh, planned at a very large scale. And it's his opinion that, you know, that's where it all went wrong. It was, com com it was complete failure. And he attributes that to a kind of siloed mentality of everyone just doing their bit, but in a, but in a way in which... It's obviously very poor collaboration. That's what he's saying, poor collaboration. Thomas Heatherwick has a phrase he, which he uses he, from his experience of working on the new London bus, which he calls the cacophony of independent decisions. So that's like a kind of 
They go to the expert for accessibility and safety on a bus and uh, they ask him to sort of design uh, handrails that are really visible. So he says, yes, that's, I can do that. I, if you want visible handrails, I'll give you visible handrails. So you walk on the bus and you're sort of going like that. They're just so bright. And obviously, and everybody's doing this. Everyone's like taking their own particular role really seriously, but not consulting with everyone else. When you put it all together, it's a nightmare. And this is, and that's why it's so amazing with the design of the bus, even the tread on, on the stairs, the way it sort of turns up at the back. I've only seen this in pictures. I've still not managed to go on one of these buses yet. You know, I might, I might, um, I might, you know, completely sort of disagree with what I'm about to say after, but, but it's just the pattern, even the pattern in the tread and the way it turns up the stairs and also the way he's designed the kind of casing of it. Before you'd go up the stairs and your face would be up against fiberglass, but that's why he's got that, that ribbon of window that sort of goes up so that when you're going up, you're looking outside. So it's little things like that. This is, this is where designers really, but obviously working with other designers, 2D designers, 3D designers, interactive designers, service designers. Um, that's why it's so, so important that we all work together because that, there's an example of, 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 of what happens when it's done well. And in editorial design, and John can sort of back me up on this, it's, it's crucial, especially well, Linda especially, working on a weekly. We, we have the luxury of a quarterly. God knows what it's like for a weekly. Very well structured. Right, I'm sure it was. Yes, yeah. But it, it was exhausting working on, on I. I worked out that I only had about four weeks to do anything else. So my own design company, we were still doing exhibition design. I didn't sort of leap out. It would have been lovely just to do I on its own. But I couldn't afford to do that. So I had other... other designers in the studio doing other things on exhibitions at the same time. And I had to stop doing I because I realised I wasn't learning anything about exhibition design. But, but the thing with, with an editorial structure, it's obviously what's really, really important is, is the designers, the art directors, creative director, whatever you want to call him, his very close relationship with the editor. That's, that's a very, you know, crucial... And in fact, I mean, John, you're probably... I mean, I haven't done this since uh, nearly 10 years. So I'm, I, I realise, as I'm about to talk about it, I'm a bit rusty about that, you know, the anecdotes aren't going to come very cleanly. So maybe, you know, you might be a better person to talk about um, the, how, how it, what it's like working with Simon. But I mean, for me, from my experience, my memory, John was a very key person, and so was um, Nick Deschamps at, at Repro, because it's like you're really at the sharp end then, and it's... It's Nick who's helping you really make sure everything, all this stuff gets done on time. Well, I had a question to ask you, Nick, actually. <laughs> Which was, uh, you talked about the, uh, the tyranny, tyranny of branded guidelines. And that it was like being with your hands tied behind your back. But Linda's just brought up the... Sorry. Uh, you talked about the tyranny, tyranny of branded guidelines and having your hands tied behind your back. But... Linda's just brought up the uh, issue of having a structure, which we all do in publications of any sort, whether they're once a year or once a week or a daily newspaper. Um, yeah. And you have guidelines, you have style sheets, you have certain ways of doing things, certain ways of structuring things, um, certain typefaces, certain series of if you like, straight jackets that you, you pour your content into. Yeah. Now, what, what occurred to me while you were talking about the, the, those problems with uh, museums is that those brand guidelines haven't necessarily been devised in, in an editorial framework. No. They've been devised purely for the sake of imposing our logo and our typeface <laughs> on things, whereas in a magazine, um, you actually look for the typefaces that do the job you want to do, which is to communicate the writers you have, who could be, there could be hundreds, thousands of different writers and photographers, illustrators, people who, you know, some of whom are quite close to the press, some are quite a long way outside. So there seems to be um, a very good analogy, as you put it, between the editorial process and the museum, but that the museum's 
perhaps haven't been set up or haven't evolved in the same way as a magazine or a newspaper. Would, mm. would that be a fair comment? I think um, a magazine is in series. It's sort of happening regularly. Um, most of the exhibitions that we're doing are one-offs. They just happen in a moment in time. And I think it's really important that you reflect the voices that are involved in them. That's the curator, individuals. I think as soon as the institutional voice through branding starts to creep in, you lose... Um, the, the, it, it's harder to sort of uh, make the exhibition take on the character of those involved. I think, for me, it, with it, what you're saying in, in the editorial design, it, it kind of makes sense to have a system. Otherwise, and you know, we were, we, we tried it. We we tried to make each issue, quarterly issue, quite different. You know, thematic-wise, we introduced things like changing the headline typeface, which you're still doing. Um, and obviously, there are lots of things that change. That's, that's a good piece of editorial design if it's flexible to lots of different kinds of content. But ultimately, most brand identity is focused on. Um, the object, which is either a product or an institution. And it's about um, getting you there, getting you either by the product or getting you to the museum. And that's completely fine. When it falls down is when you've crossed that threshold and you've then entered a particular story, a particular space about a very particular thing. That's when um, I just feel you need all options available to be able to respond as specifically as possible. And a brand identity being told to only use, I mean, the classic example is what we've experienced the last year, which annoyed the Imperial War Museum so much. They don't talk to us anymore. We have to go through our collaborators, Cass and Mann. They asked us to tell the story of the First World War using their brand colours, which were all bright and cheery. There's lots of them, which was lucky. So we were able to sort of kind of cheat and kind of find all these colours in some of the artist paintings from the First World War by, by Orpen and others, these kind of muddy, sort of destructed scenes. We pick the, those colours out of it and we use them. But because there's an enormous number of objects over, say, a single, a single plinth, what you don't want then is just to sort of see a load of caption holders. Some of the objects are quite small. Um, and you don't want to see a whole load of caption holders that are all the corporate colour. So what we did is we made every, because they had all these brand colours, we used every single one of them. And therefore what you see is that is what you see early on, at the beginning of the First World War, you see a field covered in wildflowers. Obviously later on it becomes mud, but at the, be at the beginning it's, it's full of all this sort of sp promise of spring. That's the kind of poignant tragedy of it. Um, so you've got, effectively, the caption, I hope it works. I haven't been there for ages. I'm not allowed to go there. So let's hope it works. <laughs> um, had the alarm not gone off, and maybe a question over a uh, glass of wine, um, I was going to ask a question around that, that, that around the subject of, co of consultation. Um, I wondered whether, and we'll talk about this over a bit, Nick, whether that was a kind of idealistic, utopian dream that, that, that these designers would somehow all come together. And I'm wondering if the finest examples of designers collaborating have been where they've collaborated under or for one design fascist, maybe. And if you think, you know, Comran spawned Heatherwick, and uh, we know, you know, those of us involved in graphic design, we know those design fascists in graphic design. It's their way, and everyone collaborates to make it their way. So I, I, over, over a glass of wine, we'll have a conversation about that. Um, it leaves me, um, uh, before I thank Nick, just to... And, and this is, there's a kind of link here, actually. In, we're just talking about editorial and magazines and the role of the editor and the art director. Next... Uh, Next time we meet in a fortnight's time, we have um, Tony Chambers joining us. And Tony Chambers, of course, is um, ex-art director of uh, GQ, and uh, he was at the Sunday Times. He's now, I think his title is editor-in-chief at, at Wallpaper, where he's moved from not only working as the art director, but being the editor. So rather than having to fight constantly with the editor, editor he became the editor, and almost, you know, perfectly the, the ultimate design fascist. So maybe we'll have questions for Tony around that. Mm -hmm. but. 
Thank you very much, Nick. That was very thought-provoking. Some great material. <laughs> Thank you.